Hi there. Uh, in this video, um, I'll discuss uh, sexual selection, which is important in animal, uh, animal species, but not so much in any other groups of organisms. Um, sexual selection has evolved in those species that uh, can see and hear and smell each other. And so primarily in animals, the, uh, f the male who can attract uh, more females then can reproduce more often to, to get its um, genes spread throughout uh, the next generation. However, this often makes the males more susceptible to predation. For example, in the female Tungara frogs, uh, they prefer more complex male calls. However, the bats that eat the frogs also can hear the males, so the more elaborate and the longer calls lead to more predation due to um, them being uh, attracting the uh, predator as well. In many cases, but not all cases, uh, the male um, is has a more colorful pattern, uh, makes more calls, and then uh, has other behaviors that uh, will attract not only the female um, for a mate, but also will attract predators. So the coloration of the macaw as well as its call can attract predators. Uh, this bird over here has a pouch that it um, inflates and it has a mating call that goes along with this. Uh, this bird, the male, has a, an elaborate hood uh, and it dances around in front of the female who's more drably colored. So that attracts um, predators and then this bird down here uh, makes um, a, an area, collects things all in blue. Uh, in front of uh, the area where he wants the female to come to mate. So not only are these complex behaviors, which somehow attracts uh, the female, but they're also uh, dangerous <laughs> behaviors in that um, they will attract um, onlookers, including predators. But sexual selection is important because it does signify that the, that the male uh, is in good condition both physically and mentally, which is an advantage for the uh, offspring uh, for that female. So in animals, uh, there has always been a strong selective advantage uh, for certain behaviors. So this is true uh, for arachnids. This uh, male spider is uh, presenting his colors essentially to the female. Uh, in crustaceans, such as these horseshoe crabs, which gather together uh, in certain behaviors to mate. And then uh, in uh, lizards and other reptiles, as well as amphibians, uh, the males fight to show their strength uh, to protect um, mating uh, preferences of the female. And then in birds also, these birds have uh, staked out different territories uh, and will protect those territories in preparation for mating. And more of this in um, uh, snakes in a mating ball uh, have certain behaviors uh, during that mating process to gather together like that. Um, amphibians uh, demonstrating his colors and also a song to attract the female. And then in many birds, uh, they exhibit uh, little dances that they do. Uh, insects also can do uh, little dances for one another too uh, in preparation for mating or in attracting a mate. So very complex behaviors uh, that have evolved um, to assure that you have um, a functioning, especially mentally and physically functioning uh, pair of organisms, male and female. And this was one thing that puzzled Darwin. Uh, he said, the sight of a feather in a peacock's tail whenever, whenever I gaze at it makes me sick. Uh, because he couldn't really explain it by natural selection. Uh, because uh, being attractive, uh, sticking out, means that you're more uh, likely to be attacked by a, a predator. So in a, in a way, he sort of missed the point that um, the coloration and the behaviors indicated something about the fitness, um, the uh, physical fitness of the organism, as well as the mental fitness of the organism in order to be able to um, 
uh, undergo uh, attracting a mate and mating. The fact that it is uh, quite dangerous to stick out in a crowd uh, and to uh, be noisy, uh, as some of these calls are, uh, indicates how important uh, the, this sexual selection and, the, and these behaviors are to those uh, species. So while natural selection is a differential reproductive success due to variation among individuals in survival and fecundity, that is reproductive success, um, sexual selection is the differential reproductive success due to variation among individuals in success at uh, attracting and finding mates. So natural selection is more about uh, the physical nature of the organism. And sexual selection has to do also with the um, physical attributes of uh, the individual, but also the behavioral or um, mental capabilities of the individual. Because making eggs, growing fetuses, and nurturing offspring is more costly than making sperm, uh, females may be more choosy for their mates. Uh, conversely, males compete with other males for the females and try to mate with as many females as possible. So sexual selection is based on male-to-male -male competition and by female choice. So this uh, intrasexual selection uh, has to do with male uh, competition. Uh, which can be quite dangerous. They can actually end up killing w one or the other, or sometimes both are killed or uh, severely injured. So it's a dangerous thing to do. Um, then there's intersexual selection, that is female choice. Uh, which one uh, of the males does she choose? And sometimes uh, it doesn't seem so obvious, other times it seems quite obvious. In animals where there has been this uh, male competition, then there has been a tendency to develop sexual dimorphism, where the males are larger, sometimes brightly colored, and the females are smaller and usually more um, uh, colored more in a dull um, or um, camouflaged way. So here's a male and female um, peacock. Uh, red deer, lions, uh, different types of fish, uh, and um, lizards, male and female. Uh, in some cases, sexual dimorphism uh, is due to other uh, factors. Uh, in this case, in a purple-throated uh, carob uh, bird, the uh, male and female feed uh, from the nectar of different flowers. So one has a longer beak, and one has a shorter beak. And then in this case of the hollyhock weevil, uh, the female snouts are, are longer because they bore holes into the buds of plants into which they deposit their eggs. So they're larger than the male in this case. After mating, uh, there can be a great difference in the parental investment. So uh, male orangutans spend uh, very little time around the females, uh, and the females actually spend uh, seven to eight years caring for their offspring. And in 90% of mammals, the females do most of the parental care. Uh, conversely, in birds, about 90% of bird species, there's uh, pretty much equal sharing of care of the offspring by males and females. So this can have something to do uh, with the um, sexual selection as well. In some species, some bird species, um, the males do more of the parental care, and the females actually are the ones who compete for the males. So this happens in pipefish, uh, some seahorses, uh, giant water bugs, and some birds, hyenas, etc. Uh, and so the females are usually more aggressive towards one another than uh, the males are towards one another. And this uh, points out one general aspect of evolution uh, and uh, diversity. Almost any sort of uh, condition that you can think of, you'll probably find it out there in nature. So all of these uh, behavioral consequences of asymmetry um, lead to the following sexual selection predictions. 
Uh, first, males should be competitive overall. Uh, that is a struggle between individuals of the same sex, mainly males, although, as I said, occasionally females, is to drive away or kill their rivals. Uh, secondly, females should be choosy, so a struggle between individuals of the same sex, again, mainly males, to excite or charm females who select agreeable partners based on good taste or um, good genes. And here I'd like to point out, too, that um, if uh, an organism, the male, let's say, is calling, making a call, uh, the female has to hear that and sort of process that um, as a certain signal. So that takes uh, behaviors on both uh, cases. Also, as uh, an organism, you know, takes care or grooms itself, uh, that is also a visual signal to the female and the male, depending on which way things are going. And also uh, something that's often left out of the equation uh, are odors. So both emitting odors, certain certain sexual or odors, um, as well as being able to sense those, to be able to smell those. A couple of other things that are involved in all these behaviors. So here's an example in damselflies where there's male-to-male -male competition. Uh, so the males uh, do several things to ensure their reproductive success. One is they guard their mates. Uh, second is they have prolonged copulation. So they start and they stay um, connected for quite some time. After they're finished, they deposit a copulatory plug so that no other male can uh, fertilize the female, and then they apply pheromones to the female to reduce her attractiveness to other males. Um, however, um, some damselflies can remove uh, the sperm from a previous mating so that then they can start the whole process over. Uh, and then some produce more sperm in the presence uh, of other males. That is, if other males are around, they'll actually produce more sperm. So each one of these behaviors and mechanisms have evolved uh, in a process that then has produced um, individuals with uh, all of these characteristics um, to ensure their reproductive success. So what do choosy females get from being choosy? Well, first of all, they get better genes for their offspring. Secondly, they get resources for themselves that also help their offspring. And third, they may simply have a pre-existing uh, sensory bias. Uh, but you have to ask yourself why that is. And the, uh, the, the simple answer is that evolutionarily, uh, these biases have been kind of locked in. Uh, and uh, so that they probably are relatively unconscious decisions uh, that she's making other than she likes the looks of the male, she likes the smell of the male, she likes the way he dances, she likes the sounds he makes, etc. These are all indicators of successful gene combinations in alleles, but uh, she's not making a decision as to whether they are in, uh, they have good genes or not. Females choose males that have good signs, you know, good good characters. Uh, that, that indicate they have good genes, although she's not thinking about genes. Um, but they make uh, one uh, individual uh, more fit than the other, uh, and pro possibly the progeny will be a uh, better fit as well. The peahens preferentially mate with peacocks that have the most elaborate tails, but is there any evidence that the progeny of the males with larger tails are more fit? And the answer actually has been tested, and the answer is yes. And this came from a study uh, from 1994 where eight young offspring of peacocks with different sized eye spots on their tails were released into a park in England and followed for two years. And then they looked at the number um, that survived versus the size of the eye spots of their progeny. And what they found was that uh, the larger the eye spot, the more of those uh, peacocks uh, survived and, and uh, reproduced. And here's another example of female preference. Uh, the uh, gray tree frogs were tested um, with a loudspeaker. 
um, so that they reproduce the sound of a um, frog, a male frog with a long call versus a short call. And the females would always go towards uh, the um, speaker with the long call and away from the one with the short call. And they would also bypass speakers uh, that had the short call and go towards uh, the speakers with the long call by about uh, three to one or four to one. So this indicates preference, but it also indicates a bit of variability because they would uh, uh, sometimes go uh, towards the sound with a short call, which means that the um, individuals with a short call still would have a chance uh, for reproduction with those females. There also was a difference in fitness of the offspring for uh, the long calling male frogs versus the short calling male frogs. So they were tested under high food uh, amounts and low food uh, conditions. In many cases, um, when comparing larval growth time to metamorphosis, mass at metamorphosis, larval survival, and post-metamorphic growth, uh, there was not a lot of difference between the uh, long calling male frogs and the short calling male frog um, progeny. Although in a few cases, uh, for instance, uh, low food, larval growth was better, time to metamorphosis was better. You know, there were certain uh, times when the long calling frog progeny fared better than the short um, um, calling male frog uh, progeny, which in an evolutionary sense then would uh, lead to a female preferring the long calling uh, male frogs, even though um, it was uh, the call itself and not the um, survival of the progeny that she was responding to. Females also uh, are selective in uh, their mates, also more so than males are actually. Um, and uh, sexual dimorphism is the result of that as well, um, it's especially in height. Uh, here's an example. So for men up to about age 50, men with children are slightly uh, taller than men without children. So there is a, a selection by the females for taller men. The result of this is then men are usually taller than women in general. Uh, for women, the ones that were a bit under the average height had more offspring. So this also uh, pushes this sexual dimorphism in height in that direction also to where men are generally taller than women. So uh, the investment uh, of uh, parental time to offspring also has, um, been, has evolved in different uh, species in different ways. So there's a, a limited amount of time and resources. And so this results in some uh, conflict and trade-offs. So there's sexual conflict between the female and male parents over how much time is, uh, um, is devoted by each of the parents. There's parent offspring uh, conflicts, again, over the supply and demand for care. And there's also sibling con uh, conflict, competition between siblings over the investment uh, from parents uh, for food, um, nurturing, etc. Overall, uh, females devote much more energy to producing eggs and then nurturing the young than males uh, do producing sperm. And it averages about three times as much energy for females. So this graph is just a summary um, recording uh, in the little circles, the females' um, amount of uh, energy devoted to producing eggs, and then in the diamonds, the males' um, amount of energy in producing sperm. And you can see overall um, through invertebrates, fishes, amphibians, reptiles, birds, and mammals uh, that that's true across the board. And then there's uh, the investment of um, parental care um, that uh, produces differential numbers of offspring. So most males uh, failed to mate, but of those that did mate, uh, then they had multiple mates and produced a number of offspring. 
so so in general on this graph on the right as the number of mates went up the number of offspring also went up uh, but for females that wasn't true so the number of mates that she had uh, she still produced um, a number of offspring but the uh, rate of increase was not as great because each mating uh, didn't necessarily uh, lead to more offspring and you can think of this in terms of uh, humans also so a male can mate with many females and they can get pregnant and have offspring but a female once she's pregnant uh, cannot uh, conceive another uh, pregnancy uh, during the time when she's pregnant uh, no matter how many mates uh, she has um, the opposite is actually true for the broadnose pipefish because the uh, females lay their lays her fertilized egg eggs into a brood pouch uh, and the fathers actually rear the young and so um, she can have more matings and have more offspring uh, when he has a brood pouch, that's all he's brooding, and so he can't accept another brood pouch until those uh, young have hatched. So again, I say that uh, anything that you can imagine uh, out there uh, is probably out there somewhere in nature. Sexual selection also occurs in plants, although it's not based on uh, behavior. In this case, it's based on morphology. So. In dioecious, uh, this dioecious plant, Wormbia dioica, uh, the male flowers are larger than the female flowers, and the males receive 50% more visits by pollinators than females. So males with larger flowers uh, achieve a higher reproductive success than plants with uh, smaller flowers. So flower size does have an effect on selection uh, sexual selection in uh, plants as well, although it's act acting on a slightly different um, uh, mechanism where the behavior now is of the pollinator and not necessarily uh, the plant. Okay, so that's the end of uh, this uh, video on sexual selection, which is active primarily in animals that have a behavior, so they can see, smell, and hear, touch, things like that. And it leads to things like sexual dimorphism, uh, brilliant um, colored patterns on in their feathers and skin, etc., uh, different behaviors uh, and other things such as that. Complex behaviors. Okay, thank you very much, and I will talk to you later.